Hi everyone, welcome to lecture number three on cultural globalization and the role of technology. Um, today we're talking cultural globalization, we're looking at three different theories that try to sort of make sense of cultural globalization or try to explain what we're seeing in the real world in terms of culture and cultural globalization. And then in the second part of the lecture, we're going to look at the role of technology specifically and how it is and has influenced um, globalization in the course of it. Quick admin reminder, um, all content as usual will, is available on Learn and on Moodle. Uh, if you still have doubts about the unit structure, please check the PowerPoint introductory session under week one on Learn and Moodle. Um, or also just get in touch with me if you have any doubts or any questions. Um, we will again next week Wednesday in the Q&A session on Zoom, we will discuss um, the online activity of this week and we'll also discuss some of the questions that we touch on during the lecture. So again, um, please um, listen to the lecture first and then do the online activity um, on Learn and on Moodle. And next week Wednesday we'll um, have group discussions and debrief on it um, together. Okay, now let's get started. So we're going to look at cultural globalization and we're going to start by asking what is culture really? Um, if we talk about cultural globalization, what do we understand by culture? What do we understand by global culture? Is there even such a thing, right? And then we're going to look at um, three theories of how global uh, cultural globalization is evolving that are very different and we're going to look a bit at pros and cons and we're also going to look at three case studies. So we're going to look at um, cultural differentialism, at cultural hybridization, and at cultural convergence, also called homogenization. So we'll see what um, those theories say, what they mean, and um, analyze what um, could be more true or not for yourself. Um, in the second part, we're going to look at the role of high-tech flows. And there we're going to look at what is called time-space compression, which is basically the idea that high-tech has um, made time and space much smaller because we can connect um, immediately and with people on the other side of the world. And at time-space distanciation, which is basically the idea that our social networks have stretched and have become much more global. We're going to look at new global media and what role they play. We're quickly going to look at who owns the internet because we increasingly depend on the internet. So who actually owns it and who controls it, right? And we're going to end looking at um, the role of social media and what it means for us as members of civil society to have access to social media and how it has shaped the engagement of civil society. Okay, so starting into what is culture? Um, is this culture in music, for example? Or is this culture? Or are both of them culture? Or is one local culture or the, and the other one global culture? It's questions that we have to ask ourselves, right? Um, the same in art. Is this culture? Or this, by the way, this is um, Bansky. He's an international um, graffiti artist that has been very famous for his social and political critique. Um, so if you want to check him out, he has quite interesting statements and art. Some people consider it art, some people don't consider it art. Um, what about food? Is this culture, can we call this culture as well? Um, do they mix? We do have burgers that have more um, local flavors now. Um, in terms of literature, is this culture or this? In sports, do we consider this culture or this or both of them? So if we go back to what Oxford Dictionary um, of English says or defines as culture, it says that culture is the arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement that is regarded collectively. So it's basically arts and other um, literature, whatever things that are um, sort of recognized collectively, right, by a community. And it secondly also says that it's the ideas, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. So as you see, the first one sort of rather links to what we could call um, global culture, and the second one rather to local culture. So it does um, sort of include the two, right? 
Now, looking at global culture, is there a global culture, right? Um, according to Benin and Dunkeley, um, you have a reading of the two in your readings. Um, they argue that global culture does exist and that it has the following characteristics. They argue that um, global culture does not have an ethnic core in comparison to local culture, right? So there's not a core of values, of ways of doing things that um, everybody sort of agrees to or that everybody shares. Um, they also argue that global culture is not tied to a specific place or to a specific time or to a shared memory and a shared history. Um, it is media driven, it is therefore top down and also profit driven. It often presents a glamorized version of the American lifestyle. Um, but they also argue that um, global culture allows people to be part of different cultures, um, especially if they have migrated to another culture, um, they might feel part of, of two or more different cultures. And they also argue that global culture sort of gives us the possibility to be part of neo-tribes. They call it neo-tribes. It's basically the idea that there are communities that are disconnected in space, um, but connected by a common interest. Like, for example, um, you could be part of an Arsenal fan community um, that has people from all over the world um, that are connected by their common interest for and support for the Arsenal team, right? Or it can be Barcelona, Real Madrid, whatever you prefer. Um, it can be around any kind of interest, right? That, that, um, and obviously social media has had a big impact on sort of facilitating these kind of neo-tribes. Um, so considering that that's global culture, right? Uh, we have to ask ourselves, where is this global culture headed, right? Um, how has it been evolving? Where, towards where is it going to go? And there are three um, big, sort of very different theories of how cultural globalization is evolving. Um, one of them is cultural differentialism. The second one is cultural hybridization. And the third one is cultural convergence. I've tried to find pictures that sort of represent them. Um, just so that it's also easier to remember them. Uh, we're going to look at each one of them quickly and we're also going to look at um, two case studies um, that might um, question the one or the other. So looking at cultural differentialism, um, cultural differentialism sort of really emphasizes that there are lasting differences between cultures. So it argues that um, the deep structure um, of culture is unaffected by globalization, that the core sort of stays the same. Um, Samuel Huntington is one of the main defenders of this theory. He has written a very controversial book that is called Clash of Civilizations that has been subject to a lot of critique as well. Um, and he basically argues that there are, well, he says seven to eight, um, I've picked eight uh, world civilizations in the world that are greatly different and that have clashed throughout history. So he basically, according to him, those eight world civilizations are the following. Um, the Far Eastern, which would basically be Chinese and uh, Japanese culture. The Hindu civilization, the Islamic, the Orthodox, that is sort of centered around Russia. The Western European, uh, the Northern American, um, and he puts Australia and New Zealand into that same box, sort of. Um, the Latin American civilization and the African. So basically what Huntington argues is that civilizations, um, those eight civilizations vary greatly in terms of their basic philosophical assumptions, in terms of their values, the way they relate socially, um, the way they understand and live life, right? And he also argues that these civilizations are the most enduring form of human associations, that they have been there for millennia. And um, he also argues that they constitute the broadest level of, of our personal identity. Um, so basically, in my case, I would identify as European, right, as a broadest um, identity. Um, for you, it might be an African identity or, um, or whatever, right? And um, he also argues that um, civilizations span over many nation states and that they're very closely aligned with race and religion, so that your identity is very closely linked to that. Um, and he basically looks back in history and he identifies three phases throughout history. The first one starting from 1500 before Christ to 1500 after, um, where he argues that civilizations were 
basically separated in time and space and pretty much left to themselves, right, with very little interaction or clashes. And he argues that then there's a phase two that is basically from 1500 up to World War II that was characterized by a unidirectional impact of Western civilizations on all others. Um, I mean, it's obviously the time of colonization. It's a time um, Western civilizations dominated um, commerce, trade, slave trade, everything, right? Um, and then he argues that after World War II, a phase three starts with, that is characterized very strongly by clashes. And he says that in the beginning, this clash was between the capitalist and the communist ideology. Until then, with the fall of the Soviet Union in 89, um, this clash sort of disappeared because the communist ideology sort of declined. And he argues that the clashes then came to evolve more around religion and around culture. And that modern age is characterized strongly by the growth of Asian societies and by the expansion of Islam, which according to him will lead to more dangerous clashes between the civilizations. So in terms of Asian societies, mostly also related to economy, um, in terms of the expansion of Islam, he sort of predicts um, clashes in terms of religion and fundamentalism. So that's basically Huntington's um, idea. Moving on to cultural hybridization. Cultural hybridization is pretty much an, an opposite theory because it argues that as a result of globalization, um, different cultures mix and sort of new hybrid cultures emerge that are a mix of local and global. It's what is called globalization, right? So according to cultural hybridization, the world is actually becoming more diverse and not less. And there is a mix of cultures, right? And um, the theory argues that globalization um, provokes a variety of responses um, which produce more globalization. So basically what it argues is that, um, for example, a Zulu community in South Africa and a Shona community in Zimbabwe are not going to react the same way or be exposed the same way to globalization and therefore um, very mixed um, responses to it or mixed ways of integrating global culture into local culture will emerge which is going to contribute to, to diversify culture. That's what the theory argues, right? Um, it also argues that commo commodities and media are used very differently by different individuals and groups, which again um, increases diversity. Um, so my Facebook might mostly have um, social rights movement articles on it, which means that I'm very much influenced by those kind of things. Um, you might mostly be following, I don't know, um, music um, groups, so you have more of an influence by that, right? And although we're living in the same country and um, spending time in the same areas, we might be influenced very differently by globalized influences, right? Um, which, according to this theory, um, sort of affects our culture individually. And then there's also um, the idea that um, that you can actually see in, in real life that in some countries, um, languages and cultures have combined into new hybrids. It's what is called creolization, right? A good example is the sort of local English that is spoken in many countries, um, where you have a mix with the local um, language that has sort of led to an English that you almost don't understand if you're not a local. Um, example of this cultural hybridization, um, a big one is salsa. I don't know if you know salsa dancing, but it has been sort of, it has started in Cuba mostly and it has spread throughout Latin America, has adapted its ways, has sort of um, taken on different styles and it is, has spread it, um, a lot through Europe as well and is now, even in South Africa, you have lots of salsa places now. Um, another example are Muslim Girl Scouts that have greatly changed the initial ideology of Scouts, adapting it to the Muslim context and also to the context of, of women and girls. And another example um, are languages like Spanglish, right? Um, people that have migrated, Spanish-speaking people that have migrated to the US that have started speaking a mix of English and Spanish that is called Spanglish and it has almost become a language. Um, so one of the defenders of this theory is Apadurai. He argues that cultural flows and also the disjunctures produce these unique new realities and cultural hybrids around the world. And he differentiates five types of flows that he sort of argues that contribute to this diversity of cultures. Um, he calls them landscapes. 
Um, so the first one is the ethnoscape, uh, which is basically the idea that individuals and groups that move around the world impact their destinations, right? Um, he's basically talking about migration. So if you have a strong migration from one population to another country, um, it, it's there. I'm going to sort of create a mixed culture, but it's also going to affect the culture of the um, country they've migrated to. So he argues that that's a flow that has um, contributed to um, a diversification of cultures. The second one um, is technoscapes. It's basically the flow of technologies that are used differently by individuals and groups in different places, and so also contribute to diversifying. The third one is um, uh, finance scapes, which is basically money and investment that moves through the world and therefore increases the interconnectedness. <clears throat> the fourth one um, is media, so it's basically information and images created by the media that circulate the world that, according to him, also um, contribute to creating more and different cultures. And the last one is ideoscapes, which is basically idea, ideologies and counter ideologies that emerge to it that also circulate the world and that affect different places and people in different ways. So according to him, um, each region, each group, each individual will be affected and also affect um, those flows differently. And all of this will sort of increase global diversity. So that's cultural hybridization. Moving on to this third one, cultural convergence is very opposed to this. Um, it's the idea that globalization tends to make all cultures grow more alike and that will eventually end up with one global culture. And there's two sort of sub-categories to it or sub-ideas. Um, one is the idea of cultural imperialism, which is really the understanding that one or more dominant cultures impose themselves on other culture. So in our case that the US and the Western culture has basically imposed itself on the rest of the world and is dominating other cultures. This is one um, way of seeing cultural convergence. The other way of seeing cultural convergence is that uh, we have some sort of a world culture that is emerging, uh, which is a more natural emergence, right? And it's basically the idea that global models of politics, business, religion and education have spread over the world and that they lead to uniformity. Um, so it's basically seen that this global culture is shaped by countries, by organizations and institutions, as well as individuals. And that we're slowly sort of moving into this world culture where we're all sort of be living the same culture. So maybe a question here at this um, place. Um, thinking of the current education system here in South Africa, but also globally, um, where do you see it? Do you think it is cultural imperialism or is it rather world culture? Or is it none of them? Um, what about the ideology of human rights? Is it something that was imposed through imperialism? Or do you consider it rather something that the world sort of elaborated together? Um, so is it part of world culture rather? And the same with the system of democracy. Uh, which, which of the two would you assign it to? Um, maybe it's something that we can discuss. Um, examples of cultural convergence, uh, or it's also called homogenization, are what is called the McDonaldization. So it's basically the spread of fast food restaurants throughout the world. They, they have brought uh, more efficiency, it's more predictable, it's more controlled, but it also generates the sameness, right? Uh, you can go to McDonald's anywhere in the world and you might have a few local adaptations, but it's basically the same, right? And another example is what they call the globalization of nothing. So that's basically the idea that there are structures or forms um, that are very easy to transfer to another culture or to another place because they're basically empty. So for an example is a shopping mall, a chain store product, credit cards, ATMs. So it's basically something that you can copy quite easily because it's sort of an empty structure. Um, this picture is the Great Mall of China. It's one of the biggest malls in the world. Um, yeah, and it's funny enough, it's called the Great Mall of China. So now, um, what do you think? Which one is the winner? Uh, which theory do you consider the most justified? Why are there elements to each one of them that you might um, consider are valid? Which ones are less valid? Uh, what might be critiques to each theory? 
I'm quickly going to touch on the critiques, but I would like you to think about the two first questions as well for yourself. So looking at critiques, um, the critique to, to Huntington and cultural differentialism is that it's very simplistic, right? And um, it was also criticized a lot because it promotes cultural racism and Islamophobia. And Huntington himself has made very controversial statements, especially against Islam, calling it an inherently violent culture. So he has been criticized very strongly um, for that. Um, he's also criticized because um, differentialism basically reduces each group to a set of cultural criteria. And it also reflects a belief in the superiority of the West, because Huntington is very concerned about multiculturalism because he sees it as a threat, but mostly to, to Western dominance, right? So there might be elements to it that um, can be valid, but these are like the main critiques that have come up to this theory. Um, critiques of cultural hybridizations are basically that um, it might be there, but it does not necessarily threaten the dominance of Western media culture. So it sort of questions how much agency the people really have and how much we are influential and manipul manipulatable yeah, by, by Western media culture, right? And it also argues that hybridization does not necessarily prevent the fact that we might be going towards a a world culture because both could happen at the same time and it also argues that um, many big non-western brands have actually originated in western markets sometimes so um, the idea of really being a hybridization is questioned right and then the third one um, the cultural convergence theory um, is basically criticized because um, cultural, local culture has not really disappeared over time. Um, I think one can argue that as well. There are cases of cultures that have disappeared, uh, I would personally think. But, um, and a critique is also that, um, that there is, that people have more agency than what cultural convergence assume. So that people are actually able to interpret outside culture in their own way and to decide what to assimilate and what not, that it's not simply just an imposition. And a big critique is also that uh, many people can and are juggling multiple cultural identities and increasingly because you have increasingly people that have multiple um, cultural backgrounds. And also, a um, last critique is that Western culture can um, cause pushbacks so that it has actually made other cultures grow stronger, sort of. Which links back a little bit to, to Huntington, right, and his idea of, of the clash of civilizations. Okay, so let's look at two um, case studies. Um, it's two videos, they post uh, four to five minutes. Um, the first one is about the globalization of the Maasai culture in Kenya and in Tanzania and how the Maasai um, have decided to react to it. Um, the second one is a speech by the sister from the Emir of Qatar about globalizing the local or localizing the global and um, how Qatar is doing that. So while you're watching the two case studies, um, keep the following questions in mind. Um, which theory or elements of the theories that we discussed do you think each of the case study reflects and why? Um, what is fundamentally different about the two cases and about the approach to cultural globalization? What do you think of the Maasai approach? And on the other hand, um, what do you think or what do you did you understand is Sheikha's, but that's the second uh, movie, um, Sheikha's position on global culture and do you share her opinions on culture and importance of art? So I'm just going to show you the two videos and then I'm going to um, put up the questions again. brightly colored robes, the Maasai of Kenya and northern Tanzania are one of the most recognizable ethnic groups of Africa. Their semi-nomadic lifestyle and strong cultural identity hasn't escaped the notice of global commercial brands, which have used the Maasai name to sell everything from four-wheel drive cars to running shoes and fashion. Some tribesmen have now had enough. If there is a way that this uh, um, culture can also benefit the Maasai, it would be excellent because, uh, for example, right now, 
we have children who are going to school and uh, for you to be able to get money you have to sell a cow our women do not have any other source of money or our men do not have any other source of money apart from selling cows and yet we are seeing a lot of people making money from our culture Isaac Olay Tilolo founded the Masai Intellectual Property Initiative two years ago and has been leading a push to seek protection for the Masai brand. They could then demand financial compensation for using their name and image, money that is sorely needed as more than 70% of the Masai live below the poverty line. But there's a long way to go before they can even think about registering a Masai trademark. First, the whole community has to support the idea. And that's no mean feat when they're spread across two countries. Uh, three million Maasai, around 2.8, in both countries, Kenya and Tanzania, to rally behind this intellectual property initiative and come together and defend their culture and defending it. So far, Isaac has reached almost half of the Maasai community through outreach events and live phone-ins in the Ma language. If the Maasai choose to support the plan, they would have to create a general assembly of Maasai elders, trained in intellectual property, who could handle the legal side of things, as well as organize how the income would be distributed. It's a big shift for the Maasai to think of their own traditions as a trademark, but most seem to welcome the change it could bring. <laughs> My mother taught me beading, and I taught my daughters and grandchildren. We didn't do this for selling, we did it for our own beauty and culture. But if there is a way to sell these things and benefit from it, I support it. The Maasai are not the first to seek brand protection. Australia's Aborigines and the Native American Navajo have both fought for control over the way they and their culture are represented. Intellectual property ownership is a growing area of development policy. But while it's possible to protect a product, an origin, or a name, how to protect a cultural identity is a lot harder to define. The Maasai have a proverb that reads, if an idea is good, it will be copied and followed. But in a changing world, they want to make sure they're getting a return on the imitation. And the second one, as mentioned, is Sheikal Mayasa. She's chairperson of Qatar Museums and sister of the current leader of Qatar. Both myself and my brother belong to the under 30 demographic which Pat said makes 70%, but according to our statistics, it makes 60% of the region's population. Qatar is no exception to the region. It's a very young nation led by young people. We have been reminiscing about the latest technologies and the iPods and for me the abaya, my traditional dress that I'm wearing today. Now this is not a religious garment, nor is it a religious statement. Instead, it's a diverse cultural statement that we choose to wear. Now I remember a few years ago, a journalist asked Dr. Sheikha, who's sitting here, president of Qatar University, who by the way is a woman, he asked her whether she thought that the abaya hindered or infringed her freedom in any way. Her answer was quite the contrary. Instead, she felt more free. More free because she could wear whatever she wanted under the abaya. She could come to work in her pajamas and nobody would care. <laughs> Not that you do, I'm just saying. <laughs> My point is here, people have a choice. Just like the Indian lady could wear her sari or the Japanese woman can wear her kimono. We are changing our culture from within, but at the same time we are reconnecting with our traditions. We know that modernization is happening, and yes, Qatar wants to be a modern nation, but at the same time we are reconnecting and reasserting our Arab heritage. It's important for us to grow organically, and we continuously make the conscious decision to reach that balance. In fact, research has shown that the more the world is flat, if I use Tom Friedman's analogy, or global, the more and more people are wanting to be different. And for us young people, they're looking to become individuals and find their differences amongst themselves. Which is why I prefer the Richard Wolk analogy of globalizing the local and localizing the global. 
We don't want to be all the same, but we want to respect each other and understand each other. And therefore, tradition becomes more important, not less important. Life necessitates a universal world. However, we believe in the security of having a local identity, and this is what the leaders of this region are trying to do. We're trying to be part of this global village, but at the same time, we are revising ourselves through our culture institutions and culture developments. I'm a representation of that phenomenon. And I think a lot of people in this room, I can see a lot of you are in the same position as myself, and I'm sure, although we can't see the people in Washington, they're in the same position. We're continuously trying to straddle different worlds, different cultures, and trying to meet the challenges of the different expectations from ourselves and from others. So I want to ask a question. What should culture in the 21st century look like? In a time where the world is becoming more personalized, when the mobile phone, the burger, the telephone, everything is its own personal identity, how should we perceive ourselves and how should we perceive others? How does that impact our desert culture? I'm not sure of how many of you in Washington are aware of the culture developments happening in the region and the more recent Museum of Islamic Art opened in Qatar in 2008. I myself am personalizing these culture developments, but I also understand that this has to be done organically. Yes, we do have all the resources that we need in order to develop new culture institutions, but what I think is more important is that we are very fortunate to have visionary leaders to understand that this can't happen from outside. It has to come from within. And guess what? You might be surprised to know that most people in the Gulf who are leading, leading these culture initiatives happen to be women. I want to ask you, why do you think this is? Is it because it's a soft option, we have nothing else to do? No, I don't think so. I think that women in this part of the world realize that culture is an important component to connect people, both locally and regionally. It's a natural component for bringing people together, discussing ideas, in the same way we're doing here at TED. We're here, we're part of a community, sharing our ideas and discussing them. Art becomes a very important part of our national identity. The existential and social and political impact an artist has on his nation's development of culture identity is very important. You know, art and culture is big business. Ask me, ask the chairperson and CEOs of Sotheby's and Christie's. Ask Charles Saatchi about Brit art. They make a lot of money. So I think women in our society are becoming leaders because they realize that for their future generations, it's very important to maintain our cultural identities. Why else do the Greeks demand the return of the Elgin marbles? And why is there an uproar when a private collector tries to sell his collection to a foreign museum? Why does it take me months on end to get export license from London or New York in order to get pieces into my country? In a few hours, Shireen Nishat, my friend from Iran, who's a very important artist for us, will be talking to you. She lives in New York City, but she doesn't try to be a Western artist. Instead, she tries to engage in a very important dialogue about her culture, nation, and heritage. She does that through important visual forms of photography and film. In the same way, Qatar is trying to grow its national museums through an organic process from within. Our mission is of culture integration and independence. We don't want to have what there is in the West. We don't want their collections. We want to build our own identities, our own fabric. Create an open dialogue so that we share our ideas and share yours with us. In a few days, we will be opening the Arab Museum of Modern Art. We have done extensive research to ensure that Arab and Muslim artists and Arabs who are not Muslims not all Arabs are Muslims, by the way, but we make sure that they are represented in this new institution. This institution is, is government-backed, and it has been the case for the past three decades. We will, we will open the museum in a few days, and I welcome all of you to get on Qatar Airways and come and join us. <laughs> now, this museum is just important to us as the West. Some of you might have heard of the Algerian artist Bahia Mahdeddi. But I doubt a lot of people know that this artist worked in Picasso's studio in Paris in the 1930s. To me, it was a new discovery, and I think 
With time and the years to come, we'll be learning a lot about our Picassos, our Leggets, and our Cezans. We do have artists, but unfortunately, we have not discovered them yet. Now, visual expression is just one form of, of cultural culture integration. We have realized that recently more and more people are using the means of YouTube and social networking to express their stories, share their photos, and tell their own stories to their own voices. In a similar way, we have created the Doha Film Institute. Now, the Doha Film Institute is an organization to teach people about film and filmmaking. Last year, we didn't have one Qatari woman filmmaker. Today, I'm proud to say we have trained and educated over 66 Qatari women filmmakers to edit, tell their own stories, and their own voices. Now, if you allow me, I would like to share a one-minute film that has proven to show that a 60-second film can be as powerful as a haiku and telling a big picture. And this is one of our filmmakers' product. back to straddling between East and West. Last month, we had our second Doha Tribeca Film Festival here in Doha. The Doha Tribeca Film Festival was held at our new culture hub, Katara. It attracted 42,000 people and we showcased 51 films. Now, the Doha Tribeca Film Festival is not an imported festival, but rather an important festival between the cities of New York and Doha. It's important for two things. First, it allows us to showcase our Arab filmmaker and voices to one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world, New York City. At the same time, we are inviting them to come and explore our part of the world. They're learning our culture, our language, our heritage, and realizing we're just as different as just as the same as each other. Now, over and over again, people have said, let's build bridges. And frankly, I want to do more than that. I would like to break the walls of ignorance between East and West. No, not the soft option that we have discussed before, but rather the soft power that Joseph Nye has spoken about before. Culture is a very important tool to bring people together. We should not underestimate it. Know thyself. That is the journey of self-expression and self-realization that we are traveling. Now, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I know that me as an individual and we as a nation welcome this community of ideas worth spreading. This is a very interesting journey. I welcome you on board to, for us to engage and discuss new ideas of how to bring people together through culture initiatives and discussions. Familiarity destroys and trumps fear. Try it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Shukran. Quickly, the questions again, just for you to, now that you've seen the two examples, think about um, which theory or elements of it do you think each case study reflects and why? Uh, what is fundamentally different about the two cases? What do you think of the Maasai approach on the one hand? And what do you think about Sheikha's position on global culture on the other hand? Do you share her opinions on culture and the importance of art? Okay, now just to close this chapter of cultural globalization, um, there is a, a British economist, Philippe Le Grin. He's, um, his background is French and Estonian, but he has grown up in Britain that is a strong advocate of cultural globalization. So just to close on a positive note that can also be questioned though, what he argues is that cultural globalization frees us from the tyranny of geography and that thanks to globalization, we're no longer stuck with the culture that we happen to be born into. So he basically argues that cultural globalization gives us the freedom to pick and choose. Um, he also argues that many of the best things come from mixing cultures. And he also argues that national identities won't disappear, but 
they don't necessarily need to define us. So he considered that cultural globalization basically gives us a choice um, to pick and choose what kind of mix we want to have for ourselves. Now, question, do you disagree? Do you agree? Why? And also, how do you think Legrand's European background influences his perspective? Um, just quickly think about it. Okay, now moving to the second part of today, the role of high-tech flows. Um, high-tech flows have shaped and are still deeply influenced deeply influencing globalization as a whole and in all its forms. It's influencing economic globalization, financial, political, cultural, um, and it has really been something that has been driving globalization a lot, right? So therefore it's important to, to look at it more deeply. Um, so technology, the media and the internet um, have increasingly facilitated and directed global flows, right? thereby compressing time and space, which is called time and space compression. So the idea is that um, because of technology, because of media and the internet, we're much, uh, we're able to communicate in real time and uh, we can communicate with someone on the other side of the world, right? So it basically has sort of brought us closer in time and in space. At the same time, it is also argued that it has sort of stretched the social relations because it has um, it allows us to have um, relationships with people that are exactly on the other side of the world, right? So it has basically stretched our networks, which is called time-space distanciation um, in theory. So there's basically three sort of waves that have influenced um, or three sort of flows throughout time um, of high tech that have influenced um, the global world a lot. Um, the first one was technologies like container ships and air freight that have accelerated transport a lot, right? And that have contributed a lot to um, economic globalization mostly and also to financial globalization. A second wave um, were computers and the internet that have really paved the way for global transactions, for the coordination of global supply chains in terms of economic globalization but that have also paved the way for much more interaction, right? That has influenced political globalization, cultural globalization, and the way we interact and we see ourselves as individuals in this world. And then the third step was the telecommunication devices, right? And social media that have really allowed individuals to connect globally and that sort of allow us to also not just be consumers of media, but to also be producers and to, to make one single voice much more heard or at least able to be heard um, globally. So that has shifted powers in terms of politics, in terms of, of social um, networks. Now there's something, um, looking at the role of high tech flows in developing countries, there's something that is called leapfrogging, which is the idea that um, developing countries have skipped or are skipping certain technologies and go directly into more advanced technologies. Like one example is countries or communities that have barely had access to electricity going straight to solar power, to um, solar energy and skipping um, stages that other countries, other economies have gone through like coal or nuclear power plants, right? And another um, important example is people that have not had um, access or have not been using a phone, buying a smartphone directly and sort of skipping the stage of having a landline or of having like a crappy old Nokia phone. So it's basically this idea that um, some developing countries or economies can sort of take advantage of the experiences or of the history of other economies and skip certain stages and go directly to, to the most recent technology, basically. Um, so leapfrogging can obviously help marginalized communities acquire a voice. It can connect uh, marginalized communities to global standards and make them part of a global world. But there are obviously still barriers to it. So if there is a high level of illiteracy, if there is lack of electricity, of um, basic infrastructure, of the finances, maybe to access such a smartphone or to build solar panels. And also um, if there is a lack in economic stability in a context that can obviously negatively affect this capacity of leapfrogging. So just as an example here, this is a map, this is from The Economist 2017, so it's very recent. Um, it's a map of the current um, access to electricity on the African continent. So as you can see, the countries that are dark red 
um, <clears throat> have more than 75% of the population that does not have access, regular access to electricity. So as you can see, it's quite a lot. And then you obviously it goes down and the lightest countries are the ones that have um, less than 25% of the population without electricity. And now if you look at the little circles, um, they show you the, um, how many people have access to mobile phones, right? So in South Africa, it's 68%, um, Zimbabwe, 58%, but then you also have countries like the Central African Republic with only 22% of people who have access to mobile phone. Um, Ethiopia, only 34%. So that's the digital divide that we have been talking about in another class, right? Um, so how, to what extent is this leapfrogging or are these new technologies able to penetrate into these kind of contexts if there is no electricity access or if there is no access to network? So it's something that we have to keep in mind because um, it does drive inequality and it does um, open up the gap more because these communities, these countries um, <clears throat> are more and more disconnected from, from the global, from where the world is heading. Um, this just quickly now, <coughs> sorry, um, looking at new global media or maybe first at media imperialism or what was considered mass media and then um, at the new global media that have emerged. Um, for a long time, Western media has, has sort of dominated um, the media scene, right? So it has been seen as imperialistic, as imposing itself on less developed countries or less developed economies and influencing the media and the culture of all of those um, countries. And I think it's a, it's quite a justified um, argument because we do see that media is still to a very large degree dominated by the US, right? Um, however, there are alternatives like Al Jazeera, Bollywood, Nollywood that have emerged. And something that we should also not forget is that local and regional news have always played an important role in media. So if you look at um, how media um, is usually presented, you usually have a few minutes that are on international media, but then a big part of the, or on international news, but then a big part of the news is actually local and regional. So um, what about new global media? New go global media are um, social networks like Facebook, Twitter, but also networks like Google, YouTube, um, that are increasingly dominated by corporates. Um, so there has sort of been a shift from mass media that has um, also been governmental, so rather um, driven by states, to new global media that are rather driven by corporates, right? That are the ones that own those global media. And the, um, the interest behind it is a different one, right? When while in mass media, it's countries that mostly own those mass media channels, you rather you might rather have political interests behind. While here, because now most of the new global medias are dominated by corporates, uh, it is rather an economic profit um, that stands in the center of, of their interests. So what are advantages or benefits of new global media? One benefit is that hegemonic messages of mass media can be countered, right? So you don't only have Western messages, um, but you can bring out a lot of other stories. And the second one is that social media offers marginalized groups a platform and a voice to make themselves heard. Now, what are the downsides um, of new global media? Um, one thing that is criticized heavily is the way in which these new technologies are used and the way they're used by corporates and by capitalism to sell products. So a big critique comes from Marcuse, who is, um, I think, a German, I think he's German um, socialist who was very critical of capitalism. And he obviously sees new global media as an additional tool for corporates to sell products and to penetrate more markets. Another critique is that people react very strongly to visual, what is called visual spectacles. So for example, if you think on, of 9-11, uh, many of you might still have been very young. I, I think I was about 13 and we've seen those towers fall a thousand times. Like those images were in all medias the whole time for weeks and months. So it's a spectacle um, that sort of um, stayed in our minds, right? So the argument here is um, that new global media sort of uses such visual spectacles to um, manipulate people. 
um, into certain political ideas, into certain economic products, um, those kind of things. So that, that's a critique of new global media, that it is very easy to manipulate people with such strong visual um, images. And the other critique is that media are also used for social control of people and to shape consumer societies. That's a critique that comes from the Frankfurter School, also from Germany. So if you think, um, maybe you've noticed personally as well, that if you, let's say, you follow a few um, clothing advertisements um, in the following days and weeks, your social media is going to show you much more clothing advertisements. Or if you travel to another country, um, your Google advertisement or your advertisement on Hotmail is going to change immediately to things that are available in that new country. So if you, <coughs> sorry, um, so if you um, pay attention, you will notice that um, many things that you do on your laptop are actually noticed by the system and that um, marketing will target you accordingly. Okay, so let's look quickly at who actually owns the internet. Um, global internet governance has become an increasingly important concern because um, most of us increasingly depend on the internet for our daily lives. So the formal center of global internet governance is ICANN, which is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It is a non-profit group that is responsible for assigning IP addresses. So every time you connect to the internet, the IP address that you get you comes from ICANN. And it also assigns domain names. So if you open a new website, ICANN is the one who assigns or who allows you to get a certain domain. Um, ICANN was formed in a negotiation that involved a variety of stakeholders, but as a, although it was a non-profit group, it was linked by contract to the US Department of Commerce and it was therefore also subject to US law. Now, obviously, um, not everybody was happy about that. So you had a lot of countries that were pushing um, for the oversight power to be moved from ICANN to an international body where everybody would have more influence because the, um, the fear was that the US Department of Commerce would be able to influence ICANN too much. And at the same time, the countries were also pushing to have more individual authority to monitor the internet in their own country. Like um, particularly countries like China exert a very strong control over their internet um, there are several pages or things that are not accessible to the Chinese population. So obviously this was also an interest of certain countries to sort of be able to monitor their internet um, to a much higher degree. So in 2016, the contract with the US department ended um, because it was a contract that was in place for over certain decades that was ending in 2016. And since then, ICANN is a private global multi-stakeholder community that is composed by multiple stakeholders from all around the world. So what do you think of this change? That's the question. And um, what do you consider are possible benefits of the new um, form of the new structure? And what could be possible risks of it as well? Um, if you want, we can talk about it in the next lecture. Moving on to social media and, and how it has impacted civic engagement. Um, internet, social media and cell phones have become a very important tool for civil society and for social movements because it has really sort of given a way um, to a much higher degree of participation from those kind of, of actors and it has made um, civil society a much more important actor in, in the global in the global sphere, um, together with nation states, together with corporates, together with international organizations. Um, so the internet, social media and cell phones have really um, benefited or, or um, facilitated the spread of news and the capacity to raise awareness about specific issues. It allows civil society to coordinate activities, to organize internet petitions and pressure groups, to denounce malpractice of corporates and of governments as well. It allows to link movements and networks globally, and it has also sort of allowed to develop a collective identity around certain issues. Um, so in generally, the big change is really that um, especially social media allows a much broader participation and it allows um, users to become producers as well. So it's not like with mass media that you just consume, but with social media, you can easily become a producer as well. 
and I want to show you this quote. Um, it comes from Nicaragua, a country where I used to live in Central America um, that is currently going through a hectic uprising. They are trying to um, basically get the current president, who has increasingly become a dictator, um, to make him step down and out of power. So um, what civil society says is anyone with a cell phone nowadays becomes a journalist in this conflict. So we've seen that um, although national media in Nicaragua is controlled by the government and all um, non-governmental channels has, have been put off and have been closed down, um, civil society through their cell phones and through the capacity of taking a picture, or taking a video of anything that is happening, of anyone who is getting attacked, of people that are being shot, um, becomes a journalist and that even um, official media, the ones that were closed down, have moved to um, social media. So they have just changed their broadcast onto social media and all the news are available there instead of being available through TV. So it's really a shift of how social media has become more important even for um, normal TV stations or normal news channels, not only for civil society. Um, obviously a very prominent example uh, was the revolutions in the Arab world that started with Tunisia. So I have a quick um, video here that was published by The Stream. The Stream is a social media community that belongs to Al Jazeera English that allows different people to post um, opinion pieces um, about um, different things that are happening around the world. So this one um, is really about how social media influenced or even caused the revolutions in the Arab world. Tunisia's revolution has marked its place in history. Tunisia is now a country in chaos. But it didn't happen overnight. And weeks before the world's mainstream media woke up to the story, tweets, photos, and videos began popping up on the internet from Tunisia, warning of trouble to come. A fruit and vegetable seller from Sidi Bouzid had set himself on fire on December 18th. And suddenly, reactions on the Twitterverse were exploding. Following the hashtag City Bouzid, I called up hundreds of photos and videos showing students protesting, police abuses, and sporadic gunfire. As the messages went viral, protests broke out across the world showing solidarity with Tunisia. Tunisian unrest makes waves in Lausanne. Demis for the Tunisian embassy in London. A flash mob is planned in Berlin on Saturday. The beginning of a revolution was unfolding, and the mainstream media was just beginning to catch up. There are no reporters in Tunisia to tell us what's really happening. Mass media has totally failed. Terrorism equals lots of media coverage. Democratic revolution equals little media coverage. Tunisia's government began hacking into and deleting Facebook accounts. Protesters called for help from hacktivist groups. An unprecedented crackdown on social media. Censorship should get in touch with hacktivism. We really need a local and version of Anonymous in the Arab world. And soon enough, another hashtag appeared across the network. Anonymous. The Tunisian government has decided it wants to restrict the freedoms of their own people. In doing so, the Tunisian government has made itself an enemy of Anonymous. Within a matter of hours, Anonymous launched Operation Tunisia. Paralyzing the president's site, several key ministries, and the stock exchange. The group also shared a cyber war survival guide, sharing cables from WikiLeaks documenting Ben Ali's corruption, tips on running from cops, and proxy sites to access Facebook and Twitter. The government quickly countered with a phishing operation, stealing Facebook and email passwords to spy on activists and obliterate online dissent. But tweets continued to spread, documenting a society's breakdown. The internet is reportedly cut off from CD People Brazil. are creating barricades to protect their neighbors. Students demonstrating in Colombia, 50 miles a young man world. shot by police in his bag in Kapsa. For a full week, I watched the story unfold online speaking to activists, using Facebook and Twitter as protests turned bloody. And on January 12th, with Ben Ali's regime on the verge of collapse, Time magazine finally found the story. But the social networks had the best coverage. A new power structure had emerged, 
and protests had spread to other countries, and governments scrambled to buy time. Algeria steps up green imports. Donald employed in Saks government was free food for a year to keep calm. But the anger had already rooted itself inside Arab minds. Through social networks, Egyptians had began drawing connections in late December. Egyptians should copy the Tunisia revolt, toppling their dictator. That will start a chain reaction in the Arab world. Tunisia's solidarity demo on Sunday. Inspired by Tunisia's success, finally, the fear factor had broken. January 25th, a public holiday in Egypt, marking the day in 1952 that saw police back up the Egyptian people's resistance against British occupation. As people organized, they drew upon Tunisia's success, sharing pamphlets on peaceful protesting and self-defense. They made plans to circumvent police barricades, quickly capturing the world's attention. But Mubarak also learned from Tunisia. On January 27th, just as President Obama appeared live on YouTube answering questions from the public, Egypt's president took the unprecedented step of driving down. too late. The World Wide Web was against him. The accounts of police abuse and violence circulated online, including footage that the Associated Press picked up showing what some have called Egypt's Neda moment. A coalition of volunteers, organizations, and activists set up platforms to get the message out. Egyptians, email me if you want to post info on Twitter. To break the block on Twitter, use this proxy. For legal aid and requesting lawyers, 010. Even journalists in Egypt used their cell phones to send tweets to friends who relayed their messages. Internet still down in Egypt. We'll continue to tweet. She's safe. She just doesn't have internet access. So I'm tweeting on her behalf. To stop any news getting out, the government went after the media. Journalists were detained, and the U.S. government, which had been waffling in its response, turned to Twitter to make their voice heard. We are concerned by the shutdown of Al Jazeera in Egypt and the arrest of its correspondents. Egypt must be opened and the reporters released. Thirty minutes later, our journalists were released, showing that even governments can use social media to get things done. So to close for today's session, I'm going to leave you with a little task or challenge. Um, as you've seen, like your social media can really be a powerful tool for you to be informed, to be on top of what's going on in the world, to see stories, to have access to reports, to research, and uh, also to the most current news. So it really, it really depends who you follow, what apps you have on your phone. It can really be an important tool. So this just in case you haven't diversified your social media yet, these are just a few options to do so. Um, you might know many international news providers have cell phone apps that give you push notifications as well. So it's very easy to be on top of like daily news. Um, you have Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera English, New York Times, BBC, The Economist, El Mundo, Africa Magazine as well. That's uh, actually one that is not there. Africa Magazine gives you news from the African continent. So they're great to to easily um, sort of keep engaged with what's going on. Um, you also have some human rights organizations that have apps or otherwise you can follow them on social media pages. Um, you have Human Rights Watch, Transparent International, Oxfam International, UNICEF, UNESCO, Youth Action Aid. It's just a few of them. Um, they all share stories, they share reports, they um, sometimes share very important information of things that are going on that sort of um, don't make it into international news, right? Um, you also have pure advocacy organizations like AWAD, Some of Us and Greenpeace that are really just, um, their main function is to denounce malpractices. So um, with all of them, be careful or just be critical of what political orientation they have, what agenda they might have. Um, and then also because it's Women's Month and because it's an important topic, um, there's also a lot of women rights organization networks and pages that are great to follow because they share um, very important information and also very important stories and opinion pieces. The South African example is Sonke Gender Justice. Um, at the UN level, you have UNIFAM. 
Um, you have the African Women's Development Fund. Um, you have Men Engage that mostly um, is around gender and how what role men can play in um, sort of fighting for equality. Um, you have Feminist United, which is a page that publishes a lot um, of opinion pieces as well. So these are just a few options, a few ideas. I'm sure you might know more. Um, try to engage in some of them. Try to start following and um, check out what information they give you. That's it for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. Um, and I hope you also look a bit at your own life and how you live your culture. Um, and just ask yourself, what of it is, is global? What do you still maintain? What is important to you? Are you um, picking and choosing? Are you mixing? Um, where, where do you see it? Like what personal opinion do you have? Um, and also how do you on a personal level engage with technology and to what extent does that make you more globalized or connect you more with the world? Um, that's it. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, next week Wednesday, the Q&A session on cultural globalization on your online activity and on this lecture. And then on Thursday, I will upload the next lecture, which will be on political globalization. The reading for that lecture is book chapter five. Thank you for your attention and have a good afternoon.